You know what's great about you English? Octopussy. Man, I must have seen that movie twice. Octopussy is the 13th entry in the James Bond film series, based on the short story by Ian Fleming from the 1965 collection Octopussy and the Living Daylights. In the short story, Bond recounts his capture of a retired army admiral at his home in Jamaica, and the tragedy of the admiral having to part with his pecked octopus named Octopussy. Octopussy. Octopus. Although this would be used for the backstory of one of the main characters in the film adaption, Octopussy is largely an original story, taking cues from previous Bond entries from Russia with Love and Goldfinger for its story, revolving around a rogue Soviet plot to destroy Détente. The film also takes the basis of another Fleming Bond story, Property of a Lady, as the setup for the main thrust of the plot concerning a fake Fabergé egg. After the release of For Your Eyes Only in June 1981, it looks like 53-year-old Roger Moore was going to hang up his tux after a five-film, eight-year run. The Bond producers started screen-testing new actors for the upcoming production. In early 82, American actor James Brolin was officially chosen by the producers to be the fourth actor to play James Bond in the Eon series, after a series of successful screen-tests during pre-production. Despite his American heritage, Brolin was chosen on the back of a debonair transatlantic accent, reminiscent of Moore, with some of the grit and edge of Connery. Well, I had a little trouble with the line. Yes, it's been fixed now. The decision was done and dusted, and Brolin even went as far as renting an apartment in London for the filming. But as soon as the Eon producers heard rumblings of a rival Bond production starting at the nearby Elstree Film Studios, all plans to cast Brolin were halted. Why? Well, because Kevin McClory was producing a remake of Thunderball called Never Say Never Again, starring the original Bond, Sean Connery. It may not be as apparent nowadays, but in the early 80s, Connery was considered the definitive Bond, much in the way Christopher Reeve, Robert Downey Jr. or J.K. Simmons are considered the definitive versions of their characters today. Albert R. Broccoli decided putting up a new and untested Bond to compete with Connery would be suicidal, so the call was made to drop Brolin and bring back Moore for a sixth turn at the role at the last minute. There had been rumblings about Moore having aged out of the role after his fifth entry. He was 53 then, and Moore would be three months away from his 55th birthday when filming began on Octopussy in July of 82. Having a Bond deep into middle age probably wouldn't be accepted today, but Moore had been the most successful portrayal of the role since Connery, providing box office hit after box office hit since his debut in Live and Let Die in 1973. It seemed like a no-brainer to carry on with this success. And Roger Moore is on top form as usual in Octopussy. You have a nasty habit of surviving. Well, you know what they say about the fittest. With classics such as For Your Eyes Only and The Spy Who Loved Me Under His Belt, as well as his effortless debonair charm and self-assurance on camera, Roger Moore happens to be my favourite Bond actor despite the deviations from Ian Fleming's original literary character. The rest of the cast was assembled with Louis Jourdan and Stephen Burkov as the main villains Kamal Khan and General Orlov. My drama group in college were obsessed with Burkhoff's improvisational theatre pieces, so it made me feel like a bit of a philistine that I mainly knew him from this mad, shouty performance as the main villain. The West is decadent and divided. Just he speaks for himself and others who cling to timid, outdated... And Maud Adams returns to the Bond series as the titular femme fatale Octopussy, also functioning as the main Bond girl. Her private army of women and circus operation helps to facilitate General Orlov's evil operations, despite her not fully knowing the extent of his plan. Octopussy gets a lot of flack from the fan base and critics in general. It has a fairly low approval rating on various internet databases. But although I don't think it's as good as his predecessor, 
Despite some minor flaws, I think Octopussy is still a very solid Bond film. Low formulaic, it's still a well-constructed narrative, and the filmmakers were smart to use the property of a lady's short story as a framing device. It gives the film a detective story angle we haven't arguably seen since the very first Bond adventure, Doctor No. The action set pieces are on top form. The pre-title sequence is spectacular and one of my favourites in the whole series. The Acrostar mini jet is so cool and the foreground miniature work at the end of the sequence is stunning and still holds up to this day. The film definitely blends the Cold War feel of For Your Eyes Only, with the exotic set pieces and locales that echo the work of previous Bond director Lewis Gilbert's work on his three Bond entries. I personally rank it as third in my personal ranking of the Moore films. That's not to say it's perfect, it does suffer from pacing issues and a lack of action in the middle. The jungle chase for example goes on for a bit too long and features the misjudged It was a stupid decision to include this, and under undermines a genuinely impressive stunt. But I feel fans use this as a stick to beat the film with too much. It only comprises about 10 seconds of the 130 minute film, and some act like its inclusion ruins the entire movie. Which for me it doesn't. Bond dressing as a clown is fine in context, but they made the silly creative decision of Bond putting on the makeup perfectly, rather than having it smeared all over his face in a panicked hurry. As he would be in this situation. Still, it doesn't undermine the scene as Bond defusing the nuclear bomb in the circus tent is one of the tensest passages of the entire Bond series. You may notice that the majority of my quibbles are just silly moments that are littered throughout. It's comparable to Superman 3, which came out the same year. Octopussy is somewhat undermined by silly, dumb comedy, but unlike the former film, I don't think Octopussy is overwhelmed by it and maintains a fairly serious and grounded tone throughout, with a focus on tension and suspense and Bond mostly relying on his wits. But in this case, we do add some gadgets provided by Q to aid Bond in his mission, including a gadget watch and corrosive acid pen. Wonderful for poison pen letters. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> with the film ending on Bond retiring with Octopussy on her yacht, it really felt like a suitable swan song for this iteration of the character. However, to avoid more pay disputes over contract negotiations, Albert Broccoli persuaded Moore to return for his seventh appearance as James Bond in A View to a Kill, which turned out far less successfully in my opinion from a quality perspective. Octopussy remains however a fun film and an engaging entry into the series, unfairly written off by many fans for a few eye-rolling and inconceived moments dotted throughout its runtime.